Hi everyone, this is Ms. Lassar. I'm really excited to give you your first lecture of semester two. This is module 17, otherwise known as agriculture part one. Today I'm gonna to teach you about traditional agriculture, the green revolution, industrial agriculture, pesticides, integrated pest management, genetically modified organisms, we'll compare traditional and industrial agriculture, and then we'll talk about urban farming. Really important is that you're taking those awesome handwritten notes, you're writing down all the details that come up onto the screen, and if there's something I say that isn't specifically written on the screen, maybe it'll be helpful, consider writing it down. Uh, pause the video as you need to, rewatch sections as you need to, and I hope that you learn a lot. Okay, before we dive in, I want to remind you about all of the connections to agriculture that you have already learned about. So I want to make a statement. Agriculture is a balance of nutrient cycling and nutrient removal. Here we've got our corn plants growing in soil, and these corn plants need literal matter, atoms, in order to use as building blocks to build new molecules so that they can grow and grow corn fruits and uh, become mature plants. They need lots of different atoms, but especially carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, and phosphorus atoms, along with other trace minerals like iron and zinc and magnesium and manganese and selenium and stuff. So these atoms have to come from somewhere and then enter the plant. The carbon, the oxygen, the hydrogen, these come from carbon dioxide molecules and from water molecules. Carbon dioxide in the air around the plant that diffuses in through the stomata on the leaves, water coming in through the roots of the plant and then moving up through the xylem. And you know that there's tons of carbon dioxide in the air. Water is usually pretty available, although there's definitely some regions that experience water stress, which you just learned about. But then nitrogen and phosphorus and the other trace minerals, these are really the limiting factors. These are much rarer. So where do they come from? Well, nitrogen is in the form of nitrate in the soil and nitrogen fixers can put that nitrate into the soil. Nitrogen fixers, either bacteria or legume plants can take uh, nitrogen gas from the air and fix it into ammonia, which can then get converted into nitrate and then be accessible for assimilation by plants. And then we can also get nitrogen back into the soil as it decomposes out of dead organic stuff. So that's our process of ammonification of dead tissue, returns our nitrogen to the soil in the form of ammonia, gets converted into nitrate, plants assimilate it, we're good. And then we can just add a bunch of fertilizers. We have chemical fertilizers that are rich in nitrogen that we can stick into the soil. You've been learning about the negative effects of those. Think about cultural eutrophication. What about phosphorus? Well, phosphorus enters the soil um, initially through weathering of parent rock material. But then once it's in the soil and incorporated into living organisms, decomposition of those living organisms is gonna be really important for recycling the phosphorus throughout the soil. And again, we have phosphorus in a lot of our chemical fertilizers. The other trace minerals are mostly coming from weathering of parent rock material uh, and also decomposition of dead tissue. So what I want you to be thinking about as we go through this unit on agriculture is this question. Are these atoms returned or are they permanently removed from the system? These atoms that are being used to build new plant structures are they gonna be returned to the soil or are they gonna be permanently removed? Because these are all non-renewable resources. We have a finite number of nitrogen and phosphorus atoms on earth. We're not making any more. So if we're removing these nutrients from the soil and we're not returning them in some way, that's gonna to lead to a loss of soil fertility. So just be thinking about this nutrient cycling versus nutrient removal. Um, and as we're going through different agriculture techniques and systems, think about how this might relate. Okay, now our first official topic, traditional agriculture. So I wanna show you a couple pictures that probably match with what you think of when you think about the term traditional agriculture. Maybe you think about something like this. We have oxen who are plowing a field, turning over the soil, aerating the soil, loosening it up so that it's easy to stick seeds in there and preparing it for the planting season. We have uh, a woman picking cotton. So maybe you're thinking of people out in the fields doing all of the picking in traditional agriculture. It's a good thing to think about. And then here's a, a proud looking person 
who is standing over what looks to be a, a garden that could feed him. Looks like his personal garden. We see a bunch of different plant varieties, a uh, bunch of different like food species. We've got some flowers. We have a ton of variety here, and it looks like this could be enough food to feed a person or maybe a family. So these are all versions of traditional agriculture, which is our oldest form of agriculture. And traditional agriculture has some, some things in common. All forms of traditional agriculture have some things in common. Traditional agriculture is typically small scale. It uses human or animal powered labor. So we're not thinking about heavy machinery. Multiple crops are probably planted together in close proximity. This is something called polyculture, as in many plants being grown together. Polyculture is something that a lot of traditional agriculture farmers do by necessity. They need to, to um, grow multiple crops in order to have the variety in their diet. Uh, and so we see a bunch of different crops being planted in the same space. Traditional agriculture can definitely use fertilizer, but it uses what we call natural fertilizers. So compost, manure, fish guts, eggshells, these are all great techniques to return nitrogen and phosphorus, especially to the soil. And pest management is done mostly by hand or IPM style techniques, which I will teach you about later in this lecture. So there's different genres of traditional agriculture. Here you can see two different varieties. Here on the left is what I would call a homestead variety of traditional agriculture, where you can see a what looks like a, a garden growing the different foods that a family might need to survive. This is also called subsistence farming, and this is growing just enough to feed you and your family. Think about a homesteader who's growing the root vegetables, the crops, to can, to pickle, to last all year, to feed their family and survive. That's subsistence farming. On the right side, we have a farm that's growing one thing in larger amounts. It's not a massive farm like we see in industrial agriculture, but we do see rows of the same thing over and over. This isn't. This is all rice, and this is more rice than it would need to uh, than would be needed to feed one family. So this is rice that's being grown to sell. And this is called intensive farming, intensive traditional agriculture. This is growing enough to sell for a profit. So these both count as traditional agriculture. They're both on a small enough scale. They both involve mostly animal labor or human labor. Um, but they have different goals. Keeping your family alive, growing enough to sell. There are other techniques that are unique to traditional agriculture. One is called slash and burn clearing. So this is a type of land clearing. So this doesn't have to do with what we grow or how we grow it. This has to do with how we clear the land and prepare it for growing. Uh, this is a method that has typically been used by indigenous tribes, specifically in tropical rainforests. And there's a reason for that. What happens is a section of mature rainforest is burned down. And Crops are planted in the ashes. Now, this is why it's done in tropical rainforests. You know that tropical rainforest soils are traditionally really nutrient poor. So if you cut down those trees, if you cleared the brush away from the tropical rainforest and you tried to plant immediately in the soil, very few things would grow or you would have a really low yield. There's just not enough nitrogen in the soil. By burning down sections of the mature forest, uh, the nitrogen and the phosphorus don't burn away and they're, they're trapped in the ashes. So those ashes are fertilizer for crops. Now, this isn't something that you can do across the entire forest all at once, right? That would be majorly ecologically damaging, uh, and it's only going to provide enough fertilizer to last for a little while. So in traditional slash and burn clearing, after three to five years of growing, the plot that was burned down and then transitioned to cropland is left fallow until the forest grows to maturity. So picture a small section of forest being burned down, crops being planted in the ashes for three to five years. And then after three to five years, uh, you walk away and you let that piece of land return to a mature forest. This, in practice, is a totally sustainable way of farming. Uh, in modern times, 
this method has has been kind of co-opted. I say modern adaptations here. This is like modern perversions of slash and burn agriculture. Slash and burn clearing is now used to cheaply clear forest that's replanted as grazing land. So the cheapest way, the cheapest, easiest way to clear a mature tropical rainforest with towering trees is to burn it down. And it's tough to burn it down. It's pretty wet. Um, But once you get the fire burn, you can burn down a large section of the forest quickly. And this is frequently used to clear land that will be used for cattle pastures. The land is not left fallow uh, after three to five years. It's just replanted and continued to be used as grazing lands. And if you remember a couple of years ago hearing about how the Amazon rainforest was burning That was because of this modern slash and burn clearing that was being used to clear tropical rainforest and replace it with uh, grazing land. So these are all traditional agriculture techniques and traditional agriculture uh, lasted as our only form of agriculture for most of human history until right around World War II when all of a sudden populations were growing, troops were being sent around the world, and the demand for grains was really high, and the demand for grains was higher than we could produce. Populations were growing, crop yields were staying stagnant, so we're kind of approaching this famine situation. And there was a ton of research that was done in the 1940s and 60s uh, to, to change this landscape, to increase our crop yields. So The Green Revolution uh, started with high-yield wheat, a new variety of wheat that just produced more grains than older varieties. But it really evolved into a full-scale industrial agriculture revolution. So we call the Green Revolution this period of time between the 1940s and 1960s when worldwide agriculture started transitioning from traditional agriculture to industrial agriculture. Uh, These techniques of industrial agriculture were initially invented in the United States and in Britain, but they were tested in India and Pakistan and Mexico and the Philippines. Um, (laughs) To to be totally frank, uh, in areas where there were so many lower income people, that there wouldn't be a huge fuss if something went wrong. They were not tested in the countries that invented these techniques. However, quickly, we saw that these techniques were super effective. Wheat production doubled in just five years, when for centuries prior to that, wheat production had been pretty stagnant. These techniques were then quickly implemented worldwide, and by the end of the 1960s, about 60% of the world's rice was produced using industrial agriculture. So the green revolutions produced this incredible phenomenon where the same amount of seeds were used, the same amount of area was planted, but yields and production kept going up and up and up, and they still continue to go up as we improve our industrial agriculture techniques. That's pretty incredible. So what are these industrial agriculture techniques? Well, picture what you think of when I say industrial agriculture. Maybe you picture something like this, the same plant planted as far as the eye can see. Here you can see wheat fields. We've got machinery, heavy, giant machinery that's fuel powered. These are harvesters that are harvesting the wheat. Here we can see um, a sprayer that's driving across a field of soybeans and spraying pesticide. Here's the the guy driving the tractor with a uh, mask to protect him from inhaling the pesticides. So there are uh, features that are common to industrial agriculture methods. They all kind of operate under the same principle, specialize in one thing and get really good at it. This is also the driving principle behind a lot of the industrial revolution. So techniques that are used in industrial agriculture include large-scale monocultures, planting one thing in rows and rows and rows and rows and rows, one thing as far as the eye can see. To be honest, this is probably what you think of when you picture a farm. If you've driven through farmland, especially around us, you see all monocultures, giant fields of all corn, giant fields of all soybeans. We use high yield varieties. Chemical fertilizers might be used in industrial agriculture. 
chemical pesticides are probably used. And we're not doing things by hand, we're using fuel powered and highly specialized machinery like this power tiller, which is, uh, it's turning over the soil. It's plowing under some of this waste that was left over from the wheat harvest. This is our, our highly specialized cotton picker that is really good at driving through a field of mature cotton and pulling off mostly just the cotton tufts and leaving behind the stalks. Industrial agriculture uses far smaller labor forces than traditional agriculture. How many people do you need to operate this giant machine? Just one. That replaces dozens on dozens of people who would be needed to pick that cotton by hand. Industrial agriculture also uses expanded irrigation methods. A lot of the crops that we grow in industrial agriculture are really water intensive and they need high power sprayers, uh, center pivot irrigation machines to water their fields. Another thing that's really important to think about in industrial agriculture is the pest control aspect. So when I talk about pest control, uh, I'm talking about all of the things that might damage our crops. And so pest worldwide are actually a huge problem. Without pest control, each year we would lose about 30% of all soybean crops, about 30% of all corn crops, 50% of wheat crops, and 80% of cotton crops. So what are we using for pest control? Well, for most of the world, we're using pesticides and we're using a ton of pesticides. We use about 1 billion pounds of pesticides annually in the United States. Worldwide, about 5.6 billion pounds are used. And here you can see a map of uh, the concentration of pesticide that's used per hectare of cropland. So we use about five kilograms of pesticides per hectare of cropland. China uses about four or five times that amount. So there's different concentrations of pesticides used worldwide. Note that we use quite a lot, but we're not the worldwide leader. Pesticides are typically sprayed on as liquids or as dusts. Uh, and I'll tell you a little bit more about pesticide types now. So pesticides are chemicals that kill things. And we differentiate our pesticides based on what they kill. So here are some different types of pesticides. An insecticide is unsurprisingly a chemical that kills insects that might damage our plants. For example, we might have a pesticide that kills our corn earworms or kills our green bugs. A fungicide kills fungi like this alpha toxin producing mold on corn. Herbicides kill plants, specifically weeds, like all of the weeds that you can see growing up among the corn plants here. You might be thinking to yourself, why are weeds a problem? Do we actually care that there are weeds growing on there? Can't the corn just keep growing on its own? Well, the weeds are using up a lot of the nitrogen and phosphorus from the soil. And so with the presence of the weeds, there are fewer nutrients available to go into the corn plants and the corn will have a decreased yield, smaller ears, fewer ears, etc. Rodenticides are chemicals that kill rodents, like this pocket gopher that loves to eat all vegetables that are low to the ground or in the ground. Think carrots, potatoes, all tubers, uh, peas, and other things that are close to the ground. And bactericides, which kill bacteria. There's another way that we classify pesticides based on what they kill. It's based on how many things they kill. A broad spectrum pesticide is any pesticide that kills a wide range of organisms. For example, a broad spectrum insecticide might kill corn earworms and kill green bugs. We can spray it indiscriminately on our corn and wheat crops and it'll kill all of the insects that are sitting on those crops. A narrow spectrum pesticide is a pesticide that kills just a few specific species. So maybe just kills green bugs and their close cousins, just kills corn earworms and their close cousins. We also classify pesticides based on something called persistence. This is the length of time that the chemical stays intact and circulating in the environment. The molecule itself will fall apart given enough time. 
Uh, maybe it'll fall apart when it goes through the digestive tract of an animal. Maybe it'll just fall apart naturally from exposure to sunlight. But certain chemicals that have long persistences might be able to travel between different organisms up the food chain, back into the soil, and still maintain the right chemical structure to be an effective pesticide. So the persistence of the pesticide is going to determine things like how long it has an effect on the environment we add it to. So let's talk about some pros and cons of using pesticides. Starting with pros. Uh, pesticides quickly increase crop yields. You spray them on your crop, you kill off your pest, it happens pretty quickly, and your yield increases. Some pesticides are relatively cheap, and the pesticides can usually be applied easily and with just a little bit of labor. We spray them on. This is one person spraying pesticide on a cashew tree in Tanzania. Here we've got one person being even more efficient using heavy machinery to spray a large amount of pesticide on a melon field in Georgia. What about the cons of pesticides? Well, one of the biggest cons of pesticides are their off-target effects. When you think about pesticides, these are chemicals that are strong enough to kill something. And so maybe they just kill insects, but if other organisms are exposed to them, they get sick. If you've ever uh, purchased pesticides for use at your, your home, something that kills mice, something that kills ants. You've probably seen a lot of warning labels on the package, like wear gloves when you handle this, not to be inhaled, keep away from pets. That's because almost all pesticides, even narrow spectrum ones, will have some sort of negative effect on other organisms including humans. So some off-target effects might include killing beneficial species. Maybe we kill off the insects that we don't want because they're eating our crops, but we also kill off the pollinators. Uh, and many pesticides have major human health hazards. Some pesticides are carcinogenic and can cause cancer. Some pesticides are neurotoxins and can cause nerve damage. Uh, there's a wide range of human health hazards. Some are just irritants when you breathe them in. It'll irritate your, your eyes or your skin or your lungs. Pesticides also rarely stay where you put them. So if you take a look at these images of the pesticides being sprayed on the lower left, you can kind of imagine that just by spraying the pesticides, uh, some of our pesticide will drift off through the air and land somewhere we didn't really intend for it to go. When it rains, some of that pesticide will be washed off and will be carried with runoff into nearby bodies of water, into groundwater, we don't know where. It may have unintended effects when it gets moved into those areas. Pesticides will also lead to pests evolving resistance, which I'll tell you a little bit more in a moment. Uh, and pesticides can result in something called the pesticide treadmill, which can turn into a profit-destroying money pit. So sad. Uh, on the bottom right, you can actually see a graph that's related to the pesticide treadmill. I'll explain that more momentarily, showing how over the last two decades, the cost of pesticides, the amount of money that farmers have had to spend on pesticides has actually gone up by quite a bit, almost four times. And this is how much you have to spend on pesticides and fertilizer and seed uh, per acre. So to plant to protect the same acre of cropland in 2000 versus in 2017, you have to spend about four times as much money on pesticides. And that has to do with pests evolving resistance and the pesticide treadmill. So here's what I mean by pests evolving resistance. This is a little review of how evolution through natural selection occurs. You should be prepared to talk through this process. So even though you see a bunch of pictures on the screen, you might want to write out this process in words or in pictures, something that you can use in the future. So imagine our initial pest population. It's got some natural genetic variation in it. We have mostly pests who are in black. They're susceptible to pesticides. They'll be killed by the insecticide that they that we spray. And then we've got a couple insects that just by random genetic variation are resistant to our pesticide. We haven't sprayed our pesticide yet. This variation exists before we spray our pesticide. But then once we spray our pesticide, who's killed? 
well, most of the susceptible bugs, but the resistant ones, those two resistant bugs that we had before, they're resistant. They're not killed by the insecticide, and so they survive. Then these bugs that are left over, they breed together, and look, there were just about half of them are now resistant bugs, as opposed to at the beginning where it was just two out of our large group. Now we've got just about half resistant bugs. They breed together. Everybody breeds together. And we end up with a population that's about half resistant, half susceptible. We spray with pesticides again. Okay, most of our susceptible guys die off. We're left with a population that's mostly resistant uh, bugs. And when they breed together again, we end up with a population of mostly or entirely resistant to insecticide bugs. Now we have a major problem because our insecticide is no longer going to do anything. And this is where the pesticide treadmill comes in. When you have a crop that's infected with pests, you apply your pesticide. Most of the pests die, but some resistant individuals survive. So the proportion of resistant individuals in the pest population grows. And then when you apply the pesticide again, you don't have as much of a result. So you've got two options. Spend more money on more pesticides. Try throwing more of that same pesticide at the problem or spend money on a new pesticide, a new, more expensive pesticide. You apply that new, more more expensive pesticide. Eventually, you lead to pesticide resistance developing, and then you need to spend even more money on a newer, more expensive pesticide. This is called the pesticide treadmill. And the idea is that farmers using pesticides can get trapped in this money pit. Whereas their pesticides become less and less effective, they have to spend more and more money buying more pesticides and newer pesticides and eventually may reach a place, which is still in the future, where pesticides just don't work at all. Speaking of off-target effects, I want to talk a little bit more about pesticides, their effects, and some examples of pesticides. This is an example of the off-target effects of a pesticide that you are familiar with. You've heard this example a couple of times. This was our example from day one of this uh, year, where we talked about how when you spray dieldrin, this insecticide that kills mosquitoes um, all over North Borneo. This was done in 1955. You kill a bunch of mosquitoes and malaria infections decrease, but because dieldrin is a broad spectrum insecticide, it killed a bunch of other insects that then had uh, cascading effects on the ecosystem and even on the physical environment on the thatched leaf roofs of villagers in the region. I won't go into this in too much detail. You've seen this example a couple of times. But here are some more examples of pesticides that you should know about. The first example is DDT. DDT is a broad spectrum insecticide. Uh, it's really good at killing mosquitoes, and it was used similar to dieldrin, used to kill mosquitoes, especially to prevent the spread of malaria. However, DDT has major off-target effects in other organisms. One in particular is it causes shell thinning in birds. So as DDT was sprayed worldwide, pretty soon after, uh, bird populations started to crash. This wasn't noticed for a little while, but what was happening was birds that were eating insects killed with DDT um, were not able to make thick shells. And when they laid their eggs and then roosted on top of their eggs to incubate them, their eggs were so thin that the weight of the bird cracked the eggs. And so bird populations plummeted as birds weren't able to successfully reproduce. DDT is also a pesticide that has major human health effects. It's an endocrine disruptor, which means that it mimics a hormone in the human body and can cause system-wide hormonal effects. And it's carcinogenic, meaning that it can cause cancer. It also, unfortunately, has a really long persistence. It can last intact in the environment for up to 30 years, just cycling through organisms, through the soil, and wreaking havoc. It was banned in the United States in 1978, and it was banned worldwide in 2004. And this is kind of our poster child for our 
off-target effects and our major ecological disruption. Another pesticide uh, that's still being used today is called glyphosate, and it's sold under the brand name of Roundup, and you're going to hear about this a couple times in this lecture. So glyphosate is a broad spectrum herbicide. It's a weed killer. You can buy it at the local hardware store to kill the weeds on your lawn or sprouting up through the sidewalk. And it's used incredibly broadly in the U.S., not just in residential areas killing weeds, but also in large-scale agriculture. Remember, we don't want weeds because they take nutrients that our, our crops uh, could otherwise use to grow. So it's used very broadly for weed control in agriculture across the U.S. It's a skin and lung irritant. So think about who would be impacted by that most, the people applying the glyphosate to the crops. And it may be carcinogenic. There are some very contradictory studies, uh, some saying that it is carcinogenic, some saying that it's not carcinogenic. Uh, this is, the, the jury's out, but it's definitely a problematic chemical. Neo Nicotinoids or neonics are another category of pesticide to know about. They're also being used worldwide. They are broad spectrum insecticides. And we started using them in the 1990s, just after they were invented. Uh, use increased, increased, increased exponentially up until the mid 20 teens, when we started realizing that these broad spectrum insecticides um, had major impacts on honeybees and honeybee colony collapse started happening worldwide. We're seeing majorly decreased honeybee and pollinator populations because of the effects of neonics. That means that we're also seeing bird populations collapsing uh, due to the loss of a food source. So we are seeing a bit of a drop off now in neonic usage, but uh, it's still used pretty pervasively across the U.S. And the effects of its usage are going to be pretty long lasting as well. So is there a better option? Is there a better strategy than applying pesticides? There is. There's a strategy called integrated pest management. And this is not one thing that we apply to our fields. This is a whole strategy. Integrated pest management is a comprehensive system of pest management designed to limit the need for chemical pesticides. Integrated pest management as a system consists of multiple different pieces that are put together to control pests without needing chemical pesticides. So I'm going to go through a bunch of examples of different things that could be used in integrated pest management, uh, divided up into categories. So the first category of things that we can do to control pests without pesticides is our category of biological controls. This includes things like things that attract pest predators so that we have predators that will eat the pet pests and prevent them from eating our crops, maintaining habitats for our pest predators, and planting pest repelling species. So let me give you some examples. Ladybugs eat aphids. Aphids uh, eat a lot of our wheat crops. So if we have a wheat crop that we need to protect that's infested by aphids, we can introduce ladybugs and try to maintain their habitat so they're nice and happy and they eat the aphids for us. Gophers, uh, as I mentioned before, really like to eat root vegetables and other vegetables that are low to the ground. Uh, but luckily, owls eat gophers. How do we attract owls so that they'll eat the gophers? Well, the owls need a nesting habitat. We can install an owl box to the trees around our property that we're trying to protect to attract our owls and maintain their habitat so the owls eat the gophers. We can plant things like chrysanthemums. Those are the fluffy yellow looking ones in this picture. We can plant chrysanthemums because chrysanthemums secrete a variety of chemicals that deter many insects and even deer. Uh, and in this flower garden where we're raising flowers that we can sell, the chrysanthemums will prevent insects from eating the other flowers that we want to sell. Another category of pest management strategies is our physical controls. So we're physically controlling our pests and preventing them from accessing our crop. Uh, we might erect barriers, physically prevent 
pests from accessing our crops. We might trap the pests, uh, or we might physically remove the pests, pull them off, spray them off with water, etc. Again, here are some examples. We can surround our crop with netting or with a fence or a gate, depending on the size and the mode of access of our predator of our pest. We can pull our pest off. So these are snails that are really common in citrus orchards, uh, and they're they're terrible. They're prolific eaters. So we can pull them off by hand and throw them out. We can spray something on our crop that will deter insects. Like we can spray a thin layer of kaolin clay, which is sprayed on apples here, that will deter insects and prevent them from comfortably landing on the fruit. When insects do land, uh, the kaolin clay will irritate their leg hairs and they will fly off immediately and they won't eat our fruit. This is a cool technique. We can use burlap wrapped around a tree to trap gypsy moth caterpillars that are crawling up the tree before they reach the leaves and eat all of our leaves and uh, set up shop there. Our next category of pest management strategies are our cultural controls. So these are things, choices that we make about the crops that we grow and the timing of our crops that can help deter pests. Crop rotation will help deter pests, rotating the varieties that we're growing in the same space because we're confusing the pests. They can't consistently find the same thing. The same plant isn't being grown time after time so that they aren't able to establish themselves. Crop rotation can be really helpful. We can use pest resistant crop strains, maybe even genetically modified organisms that are specially bred or engineered to resist pests. We might be able to manipulate our planting or our harvest dates to evade pest predators. So maybe we can wait to plant our crop until after the mating season has already passed so that our insects are not mating and laying eggs on our crop and establishing themselves there. Maybe we can make sure we harvest our crop before our new pests hatch from their chrysalis. And then finally, we've got chemical controls. So these include things like pheromones that can be used to lure pests into traps uh, or pheromones that are used as mating disruptors. For example, uh, if we've got moths that we're trying to control and the moths normally find each other by secreting pheromones and then tracing that pheromone path towards each other, what if we put a bunch of pheromones in other places in the tree or in other places in the environment so the male and female moths get so confused that they never find each other and they're not able to mate. Uh, and then we do have some other categories of, of chemicals that are insect growth regulators or insect growth disruptors. And then finally, if our pest is still out of control, integrated pest management allows for the use of a little bit of chemical pesticide in order to regain control and then uh, enact some of these pesticide-free strategies. So, uh, let's compare the two. Pesticides and IPM, Integrated Pest Management. Pesticides are cheap. Up front, they're pretty cheap, um, especially some of the older varieties of pesticides. They are easy to buy. They are easy to apply. You can do a quick Google search and find out what you need. However, they are expensive as pests develop resistance and as you need more and more pesticides to achieve the same effect. And they can lead to pesticide resistance. We don't want our pests to be resistant to pesticides, but heavy use of pesticides can uh, provide that natural selection to push pests toward pesticide resistance. Pesticides can have major ecological effects and they can have major human health effects, especially for farm workers who are applying the pesticides, but also for consumers who are eating uh, goods that have pesticides on them. Integrated pest management, on the other hand, is expensive up front. After going through all of those different integrated pest management techniques, I hope you got a, a sense of how complicated integrated pest management is. That complication comes with a cost. It may be cheaper in the long term because you're not relying on more and more pesticides. And once you get a good integrated pest management system going, it, it really pays for itself. Um, and it doesn't take a lot of uh, financial input to keep it going. 
the practitioners of integrated pest management must be highly trained. It's not as simple as Googling the right type of chemical to put on your crops. There's a lot more that goes into IPM because there's so many more techniques that are needed for a given field. IPM does require constant monitoring and maintenance to make sure that your management strategies are working and to adjust if strategies stop working. Integrated pest management has far fewer ecological effects and far fewer human health effects. So our next category of discussion uh, is another technique unique to industrialized agriculture, genetically modified organisms or GMOs. And before we talk about the modern version of GMOs, I wanna tell you that agriculture has always relied on genetic modification and we've done it through selective breeding. For example, all of these different vegetables that are in the brassica family are in the brassica family because they all were selectively bred from the exact same plant. Over time, we selected versions of this plant that had particularly nice flower cl clusters, extra thick, extra thick, uh, and we bred the plants with extra thick flower clusters together, and hopefully they produced some baby plants that also had thick flower clusters, and maybe some of them had even thicker flower clusters, and so we bred those plants together, and eventually, over many, many, many generations, we ended up with something that looks totally different from the starting plant, cauliflower, this descendant of our Brassica oleracea uh, that's been bred selectively for enhanced flower clusters. By breeding for different uh, components, we can end up with all of the different fam all of the different vegetables in our Brassica family. So selective breeding is incredibly powerful, and it can transform form plants in, in just like unbelievable ways. This shows the, the evolution through selective breeding of corn. So this is how we created modern domesticated corn. It started off as this incredibly shrimpy, sad, shriveled looking plant called teosinte, um, which does have edible grains, but the, those grains, those kernels are not particularly large. There's not many of them. It's very small. But over generations and generations of selective breeding, we eventually end up with our modern corn that we have today. So these are massive changes in the physiology of the crop. And this is all genetic modification done through selective breeding. We still do genetic modification. We still use selective breeding. Uh, but we also can do genetic modification way faster now. And we do that through genetic engineering. And there's many different techniques of genetic engineering that we can use, but roughly the strategy is that we identify our, our gene of interest, either from one plant that we wanna move into a different plant, or maybe we see a gene in our plant of interest that we wanna turn on or turn off in a particular way. And we change that gene, we can edit that DNA and we insert our edited DNA into our crop. We grow up our crop and hopefully it has the new trait that we want. So this is awesome. This means that we can replicate the results of selective breeding, but way faster on the scale of months, years. Uh, with some of the newer technologies, we can do it in weeks. And so one thing to remember is that genetically modified organisms, GMOs, um, get a lot of bad press. Genetic modification is just a technology. It's just a technique. Nothing about the concept of genetic engineering is inherently bad. Although it's gotten a lot of undeserved bad press, uh, this technology, like all technology, can be used for good and it can be used for evil. And some of the bad press around GMOs comes from some of the more nefarious ways that people have used genetic engineering in crops. So let's talk through it and let me give you some examples. When I talk about GMOs, you might be surprised to learn that modern GMOs include about 90% or more of all corn, cotton, sugar beets, canola, and soybeans in the United States. Almost all of those crops are genetically modified now. Most wheat, squash, and potatoes in the U.S. are also genetically modified. So how are they genetically modified? Like, what, what trait did we give them? Well, most of them are insect resistant, herbicide resistant, or both. The insect resistant crops 
make their own narrow spectrum insecticide. And the type of insecticide that they make is unique to the crop and unique to the pests that are targeting that crop. Um, but this is pretty crazy. It means that the plants will secrete their own insecticide and pests won't eat them, insects won't eat them. The herbicide resistant crops are resistant to herbicides, which means that we can spray herbicides kind of indiscriminately all over our field and the herbicide resistant crops won't die from the herbicide. So we can spray a really powerful herbicide like Roundup especially all over our field. And while Roundup kills most plants, it will not kill our crop of interest and it will kill all the weeds that are around it. We also, when we talk about modern genetically modified organisms, I like to include the selectively bred animals that are a huge part of our industrialized meat industry. They're not genetically engineered, they're still selectively bred, but through selective breeding, we've been able to generate uh, chickens that, that are just insane, that grow about three times as much in 56 days as the chickens from 1957 grew. Some things that this has done is it's really lowered the price of chicken. We can grow a lot more chicken in the same amount of time, and so we can sell it for cheaper prices. So I consider this part of the modern GMO landscape. Let me give you some more examples of genetically modified organisms with some specific strains. This is Roundup Ready corn. So you've heard about this a couple times. This is resistant to glyphosate or Roundup. And you can see our cornfield here. Uh, you can see, look at the baby corns just sprouting up and they are just being decimated by all of these weeds. We don't want these weeds. They are crowding out the corn, stealing all of the soil nutrients. So we spray a massive amount of Roundup all over this field. And even though Roundup is a potent herbicide and kills most plants, this corn is resistant to that Roundup, resistant to the glyphosate. So the corn survives while the weeds die. And eventually that corn can grow to maturity and high yield with very few weeds around it. This is golden rice. So this is a genetically modified strain of rice that's been modified to have a higher than normal vitamin A content. And that vitamin A is what makes it look yellow. Uh, a lot of diets in South Asia and Southeast Asia are uh, too low in vitamin A. Vitamin A is a vitamin needed for eye health. And we can see the effect of vitamin A malnutrition in high rates of childhood blindness in areas where vitamin A is not found in a lot of the diets. So the idea of golden rice uh, is that these diets tend to be really high in rice. And by growing a strain that produces vitamin A on its own, you get this beautiful color, um, and you also introduce a vitamin A supplement into people's diets. This has actually had some major regulatory snags, and it just has not caught on. Golden rice was invented decades ago, and it is not being grown in major quantities worldwide. This is a kind of silly example, um, but this is the flavor saver tomato. So this is a tomato that resists spoiling. This tomato on the right is a normal tomato that after a couple of weeks out at room temperature will be shriveled, will be gross, will be growing with bacteria. This flavor saver tomato can last for much longer at room temperature. This is the Arctic apple, which resists browning. It turns out that that browning that apples do when you cut them and they're exposed to air, it's controlled by just one enzyme and the browning doesn't do anything for the apple. It's just a quirk of evolution. And so this is an apple where that enzyme is inactivated. And so when you cut into the apple, uh, it doesn't brown. There's other types of genetically modified organisms. One type of genetically modified organism uh, that we hope becomes more uh, used worldwide are drought-resistant crops. These are not being developed very successfully. These are not being used worldwide yet, although there's a lot of hope that we could be able to develop drought-resistant crops that need less water input. And then there's the kind of nefarious use of genetic modification, sterile strains. So there is a company, Monsanto, that is developing genetically modified 
crops, especially corn and wheat and soy and some of the major crops that we grow here in the U.S. Um, and the seeds of these crops are sterile. They will grow into a mature corn plant or wheat plant or soy plant, but then the seeds of that plant cannot be planted. If you plant them, they won't grow into anything. Uh, they'll produce seeds that we can eat, but not seeds that we can grow. They're sterile. What this means is that every year farmers have to go back and buy more seeds from Monsanto instead of what farmers have traditionally done, which is save the seeds from the crops you grow and then plant them the next year. So some interesting uh, correlations here, some interesting connections. Monsanto grows, uh, produces these sterile seeds, sterile strains of Roundup Ready corn and Roundup Ready wheat, uh, which is resistant to glyphosate, which is a herbicide that's also made by Monsanto. So there's a bunch of connections here. There is a little bit of nefarious uh, business action happening. Let's talk about pros and cons of genetically modified organisms. Uh, before I go over these pros and cons, one note is that these pros and cons are totally specific to the genetically modified organism that we're talking about. The pros and cons of golden rice are going to be totally different than the pros and cons of Roundup Ready corn. So as I go through these pros and cons, I want you to be thinking about which organisms each of these pros and cons might refer to. So some pros. Genetically modified organisms decrease some pesticide requirements, especially those insecticide producing crops. We don't need to use as many insecticides because the crops are making them themselves. They may decrease water requirements if it's a drought tolerant crop. Some GMOs might have an increased shelf life. Some GMOs might have an increased nutritional content, like golden rice. Some GMOs may increase the profit for farmers. If farmers can grow a higher amount of grain with a lower amount of input, that increases their profit. They may be able to pass those savings on to consumers. It may decrease the food cost for consumers. What about cons of GMOs? Uh, well, genetically modified organisms tend to all have exactly the same DNA. That's kind of the whole idea. We've created this crop with the perfect strain of DNA, and we're going to create a bunch of genetically identical seeds that you can use. Um, and that means that most of the genetically modified corn in the United States is genetically identical. You might remember from biology that variation, genetic variation in a species is a good thing because if a natural disaster happens, a pest comes, there's a drought, there's a tornado even, there's climate change. With variation, there's likely to be somebody who can survive that disaster. If everybody is genetically identical, that increases the vulnerability of the entire crop to natural disasters. Some of the herbicide tolerant strains, or all of the herbicide tolerant strains necessitate the use of herbicide. The whole point of these Roundup Ready strains is that we're going to spray Roundup glyphosate all over our crop to reduce our weeds and increase our crop yield. And so that means that we're going to have all of the cons that come with use of pesticides. Our pesticide producing strains and our herbicide tolerant strains both lead to pests as evolving resistance. Our Insecticide producing strains produce their own insecticide. Eventually, insects will become resistant. Same deal with the herbicide tolerant strains. The infertile strains, those sterile strains, reinforce agricultural monopolies. And so, one, this, I always struggle with whether to put this on the cons list or not. One of the major cons that's talked about in the media is potential health effects or allergic reactions to GMOs. And so I put that on the cons list, not because there have been any substantiated cases of allergic reactions to GMOs, but because so much fear persists about possible allergic reactions or possible health effects from GMOs. All right, let's talk about the pros and cons of industrial agriculture. Remember, it encompasses all of these different techniques that we've been talking about, from use of heavy machinery to use of chemical fertilizers to use of pesticides to use of GMOs. What are 
the pros of industrial agriculture. The number one pro is that it produces way more food than traditional agriculture. As China has adopted more and more industrial agriculture techniques, look at how their cereal production has increased and increased and increased up to 400% while they're still using the same amount of land. And their cereal production has increased far faster than their population has, which is good. This means that we're not going to be running out of food. Industrial agriculture can be scaled and adapted for virtually any country. It allows countries to feed growing populations, and it allows countries to move through the demographic transition. Remember, we need food security in order for our country to move through the demographic transition. Finally, fewer people are needed to grow more food. It's easier to grow more food. We don't need as many people to man our farms, and more people can move into what's considered white-collar jobs uh, and out of agriculture. What about the cons of industrial agriculture? Well, there's many environmental cons. We have water degradation from fertilizer runoff. You might want to add cultural eutrophication to that. You know the steps of cultural eutrophication. We have cascading ecological effects from pesticide use, especially from use of broad-spectrum pesticides, the evolution of pesticide-resistant pests, a reduction in biodiversity, especially with the increased use of monocultures, Loss of soil fertility from monoculture as all of our crops are removing the exact same nutrients from the soil over and over. And increased soil erosion from monocultures as well. We typically have exposed soil in our monocultures. We also have greenhouse gas emissions from the fuel-powered machinery. What about economic cons of industrial agriculture? Uh, A lot of industrial agriculture creates a financial dependency of farmers on pesticide and fertilizer supplies. Farmers become dependent on fertilizer in order to grow their crops. They become dependent on more and more and more pesticides as the pesticides become less and less effective. Uh, And eventually this becomes that that ever widening money pit. Another interesting con of industrial agriculture is a loss of jobs. The automation, the use of heavy machinery on farms um, uses fewer people. And so if we're thinking about job creation, industrial agriculture is the opposite of job creation. We're going to have job reduction as we transition to industrial agriculture. So one last type of agriculture that I'd like to talk about today is not industrial agriculture. It's much smaller scale than that, but it's not traditional either. It's urban farming, farming in cities. About 15% of the world's food is grown in urban areas and cities. And there's many different types of urban farming that we can see. Remember, this isn't exactly industrial. It isn't exactly traditional. It's kind of a hybrid. We can see urban farming in community gardens where neighbors come together to farm plots of land. We can see the use of greenhouses uh, and do some indoor growing in a a climate-controlled greenhouse. We might see the use of hydroponic farming. You might be familiar with this from middle school, growing plants in nutrient-rich water. So they're not growing in soil. There's not soil circulating around their roots. It's water with a nutrient solution that's been added. And hydroponic farming is really easy to do indoors, especially in cities, indoors. Um, You can also stack things that are growing hydroponically, and do something called vertical farming, which is just what it sounds like, using all of the vertical space indoors to grow rows of crops on top of each other. These are all leafy green crops that are growing hydroponically. Another type of urban farming, farming in cities, would be aquaponic farming. This is a variation on hydroponic farming. Here we've got fish living in the nutrient-rich liquid, and they're getting fish food as well. Um, They're actually creating the uh, nutrient-rich liquid as they poop, and then that poop uh, cycles a bunch of nutrients back into the water. That water is cycled through the plants that are growing hydroponically, um, and we have nice little uh, self-sustaining ecosystem here that can lead to some good plant growth. Uh, 
So these techniques are all really different from each other. They're different in scale. They're different in requirements. They're different in intensive versus subsistence farming. Um, and so they have different pros and cons. They've got different effects. That what's common to them is that they can all be done in cities. So some pros of urban farming is that urban farming can really be considered a, a method for environmental and social justice. Urban farming decreases the amount of energy that needs to be spent in food transportation. When you're growing food locally, you don't need to waste a bunch of fuel transporting it across the country. Urban farming can increase access to fresh produce in places called food deserts, where access to fresh produce is really low. Urban farming can connect urbanites to their food sources, which is something that people living in cities can be really disconnected from. Think about when you were little and you might have thought that food grew on the grocery store shelves. Urban farming, especially community gardens, can create a sense of community and identity that can revitalize a struggling community. Urban farming has a ton of challenges. Space is really expensive in cities, both outdoor space and indoor space. If we're growing things indoors, especially these high-tech vertical farming, hydroponic farming operations, our indoor electricity requirements are going to be really high. And if you just think about the physical layout of these smaller spaces, not all crops are suited for urban gardens. How are we going to be growing our fruit trees with vertical farming? You can really only grow small crops in vertical farming. You might be able to grow some of the larger ones in our community gardens, but how much space do we have for community gardens? So I hope you learned a lot about different types of agriculture today, from traditional farming to industrial farming to urban farming. Uh, take a moment, make sure your notes are complete, rewatch any sections that you need to rewatch, and I hope you learned some good stuff. We'll see you in class.